Hey, good morning everybody and welcome to the vlog. I hope the start of your day is absolutely incredible. You guys know that I mean that. Look at this animal right here. This is actually a banana and she leopard clown ball python. That's crazy. I mean, it's like yellow, orange, just fluorescent colors. It's crazy that we have ball pythons that look like this right now. And to understand how we've gotten to this point, I really think we have to rewind and figure out where we started. And it all started with obviously normal ball pythons. But back in the 70s, 80s, and really even maybe the early 90s, the vast majority, if not all of the ball pythons that were imported into the country were actually imported as adults. Now we all know that ball pythons can be a little bit finicky from time to time even as captive bred but I can tell you this much as a kid I got my second snake was a ball python and it happened to be a wild caught male that never ate. For two and a half years, I did everything I could possibly do, assist feeding it, taking it to vets, everything, and unfortunately, I ended up perishing. The truth is, is the vast majority of those imported wild animals never ate and died, and they were really considered kind of like garbage snakes because no one wanted them. Like, why would you buy a ball python? It's not gonna do well, it's not gonna eat, and it's gonna eventually die for you. So it was kind of a time when things weren't very good, but, Something changed, and I'm about to tell you about it. You see what really changed everything back in those days? In the 80s, there was a guy named Joe Fossey from Tampa. He actually went to a university. It happens the fact that his roommate at that university was a guy named Emmanuel Noah. Now, Emmanuel Noah actually came from Accra, Ghana. Now, Accra, Ghana, of course, is the epicenter for ball pythons. Ghana, Toga, and Benin is where all the ball pythons are being exported. Joe knew that these animals were coming out and doing horrible and really weren't doing well in the pet trade because of it. And Joe had an interest of the pet trade for sure, so he had an idea and him and Noah kind of talked about it. When Noah went back to Accra, rather than exporting wild ball pythons that were basically not going to survive, he thought, what if we actually have people collect wild females that are gravid and then they would actually hatch the eggs and send the baby ball pythons over. Would those babies do better than the wild cut ones? As it turns out, they did. Now back then, they were only doing a couple hundred a year, but that really was the very first start of how the entire ball python thing started to change and they went from being a garbage animal to being a viable pet in the pet trade. And that got us one step closer to that crazy banana and she leopard clown ball python. But we still have a long way to go. And it really, the next step started with albino ball pythons. The same two characters, Joe Fossey, Emmanuel Noah, ended up importing the first albino ball pythons. Now, that was the first kind of mutation outside of the pie ball that was imported in the 70s or early 80s that ended up never reproducing. And most people didn't even think was genetic. Now, at this point, a guy named Bob Clark, you guys may know the name, actually had produced albino Burmese pythons. And that really changed the reptile hobby, right? Because for the first time, there was an investment quality animal in an albino Burmese python. Well, Bob heard about the albino ball python that came in, and he was smart enough to realize, hey, if I could sell all these albino Burmese, these giant snakes, I could certainly sell a snake that only stayed four or five foot long. And he knew that the albino would be recessive. Now, interestingly enough, it wasn't just the albino ball python that came in. It actually came in together with an animal that is called a genetic stripe. Just like this one right here. And Joe and Noah actually imported both the animals at the same time. And they basically told Bob, hey, if you're gonna buy the albino, you have to buy the genetic stripe as well. At the time he thought, ah, oh, I really don't want that striped ball python, but I'm gonna go ahead and buy it. Weirdly enough, down the road, genetic stripes ended up costing more than albino ball pythons, but that's later on down the road. So Bob ended up buying the first albino ball python from Joe Fossey that came from Emmanuel Noah. He ended up proving out, and once again, there was another investment quality ball python, which really started to change things. Now we're still talking about the early to mid 90s at this point, there's still a long way to go. Enter in a long haired enthusiast named Brian Barczyk, right around the mid 90s, that loved ball pythons. I was doing business with Joe Fossey at the time, buying a bunch of stuff, and when he imported those couple hundred ball pythons per year, I would fly down to Tampa to go through them and pick out some really cool ball pythons that Noah had sent him. And that was kind of how it started with my 
enthusiasm with ball pythons because I always loved them going back to that second snake that I owned. Even though it did so terrible, I still loved ball pythons and I wanted to have more of them. So I was able to get them from Joe. They were captive, hatched in a Kragana and they did great. So I would bring them home and I'd raise them up and that's how it kind of started there. And then all kinds of things changed over the next eight to 10 years. And that basically was that there was a guy named Kevin McCurley, Tracy Barker, and again, me right here, that were buying up ball pythons that were coming in. And the demand started to increase. The first pastel, the first spider ball python came in. More mutations started to come into the country. Pie bulbs came into the country with VPI, and ultimately Pete Call proved them out to be genetic. All the things started happening. And then the interest in captive ball pythons went through the roof. In Togo, Ghana, and Benin, instead of producing a couple hundred ball pythons a year, they started producing tens of thousands and even a hundred thousand plus per year. Now, ball pythons are one of my favorite snakes at the time and quite frankly still are one of my favorite snakes. I just have always loved their little cute faces and stuff like that. And that's really when I met Emmanuel Noah. I knew that he had been dealing with Joe Fossey. He was his connection over in Africa and really the one that started the whole thing over in Togo, Ghana, and Benin, right? So essentially, a crowd Ghana where Noah was not only there but also part of the government there by this time he was really kind of controlling things over there then in Lome Togo there was a guy named Eric Fouchard and then the big guy in Abomey Benin which had the largest quarter ball python was a guy named Patrice now my connection in with Noah finally was my first step into dealing directly with Africa not that I wanted to cut Joe out of the situation it's just I wanted to expand beyond what he was gonna do again the demand started to really really increased. There were more mutations starting to be produced and it went from three people that were super excited, again, Kevin, Tracy, and myself, to all of a sudden hundreds of people and even thousands of people that wanted to get into ball pythons to the point where people were selling off all their other snakes just to buy ball pythons. So I wanted to be ahead of the curve. So not only was I dealing with Emmanuel Noah, I started to make connections with Jimmy Aquanda, Eric Fouchard, Patrice, Bien Bunu, all these people over in Africa and I started buying directly from them. Again, by this time we're talking about the late 90s and things were really fever pitched. By the late 90s, I literally was sending people over to West Africa for two or three months of the hat season just so that I would get the opportunity to buy some of the really cool stuff. And that's really when things changed tremendously for me personally when this particular mutation popped up. And it happened to be in Abomey Benin, the guy Patrice that I mentioned actually got one of these. Whether he hatched it or when the trappers brought him, we don't really know what the deal was, but I was offered the very first pinstripe ball pipe I ended up buying it for $27,000, sight unseen, didn't know if it was a male or female, didn't know anything about it, ended up coming in and I was blown away by it. Of course, a year and a half later, we ended up proving it out that it was an incomplete dominant animal. It turned out to be a male and we produced a bunch of pinstripes. By this point, it was crazy. People were standing in line trying to buy snakes that were worth $25,000 to the point where literally people would be mad at you if you wouldn't sell them one because you'd be like, I'm sorry, I'm sold out. And they would literally be upset. It really changed things to a point that it was crazy and it really changed the reptile hobby because for the first time the reptile hobby became a business for so many people and that's really what started the next phase of getting single gene animals into double genes and triple genes and so on and so on so in the late 90s and very early 2000s the ball game really was on I feel pretty blessed that I was there to see the kind of onset of the ball Python world you know now fast forward 20 years later and we're seeing all these crazy five six eight gene animals that are so absolutely mind-bending the truth is we were fortunate enough to see the first albinos, the first pies, the first pastels, spiders, pinstripes being produced. As a matter of fact, the banana ball python was an interesting story too. It was imported by a guy named Mike Vanostrom at Strictly Reptiles, and he actually brought it in, and a lot of people thought it might be some sort of form of caramel albino, so they weren't that interested in it, and it sat in his shop for like, I don't know, maybe six months. Tons of people saw it and were not that interested because he wanted like $15,000, and caramels at the time were about $7,500. A guy named Will Slough up in Chicago actually swung for the fences and bought that banana ball python. It was a female. He raised it up, bred it, and to his surprise, it was an incomplete dominant animal. 
And that was the first banana ball pythons ever produced. At the very same time, Kevin McCurley over at Nerd produced something that was called a coral glow from an original imported animal that was called the white smoke, actually. And that was one of the craziest things that ever happened because both the coral glows and the bananas started to sell for $63,000 a piece. Why $63,000? I don't know. You would have to ask them. But the fact is, they had people standing in line to pay them $63,000 for banana ball pythons. So back here to this banana and she leopard clown ball python. I mean, gosh, it's amazing how far we've come, you know? People are producing snakes that blow my mind. I mean, I look at the animals that all these guys are producing and I'm like, how is it even possible? Thinking back to 25, 30 years ago when I saw the first mutations coming in, it's pretty special to see how far it is. And the fact is, is how far will it go? We don't know. I mean, every single year we're going to have more and more interesting things and that's just what's so impressive and so exciting about the ball python world. And people ask me all the time, will this ever happen again with another type of snake or another type of reptile? And the truth is, is that I always say the same thing. Ball pythons have been the king of reptiles for the last 20 plus years and they'll continue to be the king of reptiles for the next 20 years because they're the perfect animal. They're big enough to be interesting but not so big that little kids can't handle them. They're highly, highly diverse when it comes to color mutations, and they're just very easy to take care of animals. They have everything that you want when it comes to the perfect animal. That doesn't mean that other mutations of other reptiles aren't gonna be super popular, but still, the royal ball python will remain the king of reptiles. And that's right, that's how we got here with the ball pythons. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a back history so that now you know when you look at these amazing morphs, you'll understand where we came from from the very beginning. Of course, there's a lot more to talk about with that, but at least that gives you the overview. If you do enjoy this video, here's a playlist of a bunch of really cool snakes that if you just click one or two videos, helps me a tremendous amount. Up here is my podcast channel. I talk about stories like this for hours. You can check it out over there. On this side, we are literally just over 30,000 away from 3 million. Hit that subscription button. Turn your post notifications on. Have an absolutely wonderful day. Remember, be kind to somebody, and I promise I'll see you tomorrow.